Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started with our small scale uh, farmer panel talking about um, managing for soil health, uh, farm goals on a smaller on the smaller scale, uh, challenges, successes and lessons learned. We have four panelists with us here today. Thelonious Cook from Mighty Thunderbird Edible Forest in Bird's Nest, Virginia. Hattie Allen from Hattie's Garden in Lewes, Delaware. Uh, Zach Dittmar from Dittmar Family Farms in Felton. And Tom Paduana from uh, Flying Plow Farm in Rising Sun. Um, small scale is, is very much a relative term, uh, especially when we're at an event that has farmers um, farming in the thousands of acres. Uh, our panelists here range from half an acre, kind of micro farm, up to 56 acres. So we're gonna get some different perspectives uh, on how they deal with, with soil health under those different conditions and those different scales. Um, so first, I'm just going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their farms. I'll have some general questions that they can all answer and then some questions that are geared more towards their individual uh, farm scale. But I also want this to be very kind of informal and interactive, so feel free to ask questions as they come up uh, as we go along. Uh, so start with you, Thelonious. Oh, uh, just tell them about your farm, your scale, maybe how you're marketing, um, and what are um, maybe your farming philosophy a little bit. If you have one. Greetings, everybody. <clears throat> uh, my name is Thelonious. I have a seven acre farm down in Virginia, uh, Bird's Nest, Virginia. I currently farm on about three and a half acres, um, do mostly vegetable production, um, just about everything you can think of. Some ethnic crops um, like callaloo, hibiscus, uh, gin ginger, turmeric. Um, also did hemp uh, last year and plan to do it again this year. <clears throat> um, yeah, do some cut flowers as well. Right now, my main market is over in Hampton Roads area, so um, I go direct to uh, farmers markets. Uh, thinking about doing a CSA, but um, not quite yet there. But um, I'm Hattie from, and I'm, I have Hattie's Garden. I've been doing it for about 15 years. And it's only been like the last three or four that I felt uh, comfortable with what I'm doing with my soil. But I'm real small, half half an acre, and I do uh, a lot of cut flowers. I grow a lot of um, plants for home gardeners in the spring. I do tomatoes. I use grafted plants for uh, heirloom tomatoes. I also grow ginger and turmeric and uh, a little, it, quite a lot in the way of salad greens, uh, especially arugula, it's a real quick turnaround. And then in the winter, I work with about a dozen vendors and deliver their products to my customer base so that I don't have to work off the farm. Um, and that way I've been able to sustain myself on just that small amount of, of land um, it is doable, but it's exhausting and it's hard. And um, it, you know, I keep thinking that every year it's gonna, I'm gonna make a million dollars, but you will. next year. <laughs> uh, I'm Zach Dittmar. Um, my wife and I, we have a, a 40 acre farm uh, in Felton, which is uh, south of Dover by about 15 minutes. We, um, we mainly do vegetable crop production. Uh, we also are starting to get into raising pastured poultry. Uh, we just started a small flock of sheep, uh, hoping to get into cattle soon. So um, our main outlet for our product right now is CSA shares, uh, big fan of that. Uh, we also sell at uh, farmer's markets right now and we actually, we work with Hattie. Uh, so it's great having her to move product through the winter months as well. Um, I guess our, our, our big farm philosophy, the, the biggest focus that we have uh, really is the microbiology in the soil. Um, you know, a lot of what they've been talking about today uh, is, I found to be very true. Uh, you know, you take care of the biology in the soil and it takes care of everything else. Um, I'm from Wisconsin, I, I've been down to the field of dreams, so it's kind of the idea if you build it, they will come. Um, so just bringing that soil back to life uh, getting that life right, and it'll take care of everything else. So, 
Hello, I'm Tom Paduano uh, from Flying Plow Farm. Uh, my wife and I own and operate a 56-acre uh, farm. It's uh, entirely certified organic. Of that 56 acres, um, we have approximately 14 acres set aside for vegetable production, which kind of sits on the hilltop, and the remaining acreage is uh, sloped land that's planted to permanent pasture. Um, let's see, we operate uh, 250 members CSA. We attend four farmer's markets during the main growing season. Um, and we harvest through the winter from our uh, high tunnels and sell on the farm, big on-farm sales during the winter months and also a small uh, winter CSA and online ordering that we uh, deliver um, to our farmer's market locations with. Uh, within our vegetable production for, this is our 11th season and the sixth season on our current farm. Uh, for a while, we were operating on with a bio-extensive growing method where we had half of our acreage cover cropped for one season, and half of our acreage in vegetable production for one season. And the last two years have seen us expand vegetable production, so we're kind of eating up that cover cropped land with uh, vegetable, with produce. So kind of entering into a new, uh, new domain, if you will, of, of growing. And sometimes I feel like we're maybe taking a step backwards, um, which is interesting. Um, besides produce, we raise um, about 400 laying certified organic layers a year, uh, around 1,200 broilers, both on pasture, and we have a small herd of grass-fed beef, 13 to 20 head within the season, and we will be making our own hay on like two to five acres, and then we, we graze the rest and buy in the rest of the hay for the, for the livestock. Um, we also have six horses, five of which are draft horses. Um, so we do probably 50 to 75 percent of our vegetable field work with horses, um, which kind of brings us to like our farming philosophy, which uh, my wife Sarah and I joke that, you know, we like to do things the hard way and we intentionally did that for about eight years and now we're kind of uh, transitioning more towards more efficiencies, uh, higher efficiencies and, and being easier in ourselves, and looking more towards the future of sustaining ourselves along with the farm. Well, Tom, I'm going to keep you talking a little bit longer now and ask, are you, uh, are you integrating your livestock um, production with your vegetable production? Are, are your fields rotating through? Or? Um, we do integrate uh, sometimes, and we, well, we have done more in the past, and now that we're having more of our land our, more of our vegetable land, well, let me back up. Our, our 14 acres of vegetable land is vegetable land, and it doesn't rotate within our pasture land, which would be an ideal situation. Um, but our pasture land is such that it has large boulders and is sloped, too sloped for us to justify plowing um, or tilling that. So that kind of has stayed pasture land since we put it there six years ago, and our more level hilltop is our, is our vegetable lands, and that's kind of our mindset. Within that 14 acres, we've grazed our poultry um, on cover crops, or we have our layers go, go into the um, vegetables as a cleanup crew after harvest. Uh, we've also grazed a little bit our cattle and our horses on um, mature cover crops as a mowing to mow them down and to get regrowth. Great. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask a question that you can kind of each answer in turn now. Um, we'll give Tom a break <laughs> for a second. Um, can you talk about some of the soil health practices that you've been using and whether they have been helping you achieve the desired results, whether you're seeing improvements from adopting these practices or whether, there have, whether you've run into challenges um, associated with with any particular practice, okay, is that too vague? <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in, okay. and uh, before I start, I forgot you asked me a question if I have a philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, my farm philosophy is uh, if you grow your own food, you'll never go hungry. <clears throat> um, but yes, um, so some of the uh, practices I use on the farm, uh, well, the first thing um, is cover cropping. Um, to give you some background on my, the land that I farm on, um, it was family land that I inherited, but um, we hadn't been really doing anything on it for about 20 years or so. 
uh, just let some family uh, friends, you know, uh, do like monocropping and stuff like that. So when I um, inherited the land in 2015, it was, you know, uh, um, heavily compacted. So um, that year, um, while I was doing my beginner farmer training program, I started to, to uh, just cover crop it, you know, in, in anticipation of, you know, beginning to farm it uh, the next year. But, um, and since then, I've kept a, a rotation of, you know, cover cropping summer, you know, winter. And, um, you know, from, you know, that, um, I can see the difference in uh, just the soil activity. Um, there were literally no earthworms uh, when I first started. Um, and you talk about trying to penetrate the soil, it was hard as a rock. So um, I'm definitely a big advocate advocate of, um, of cover cropping. Um, also, um, I've been experimenting with uh, no-till on one acre of land, um, and uh, some of my methods that I use there, um, tarps, silage tarps, um, that, you know, uh, around this time of year, I'll roll those tarps out um, and at least, you know, leave them on for about a month or so. And then um, that gives time for, you know, the um, weed seeds to germinate and then the absence of light, you know, uh, kills most of those off. So then I can, um, you know, plant directly uh, with my transplants in the ground. <clears throat> uh, what else? Uh, other than that, I use composting, um, uh, chicken litter, I buy the coop poop because I don't have my own livestock. So coop poop is, is very good. Um, and I usually just, you know, I'm not very um, super scientific, but I try to, um, you know, rotate applications. Like one year I'll do a whole bunch of composting, and then the next time I'll come back with the, uh, with the coop poop. Um, what else do I use? Um, a compost tea, um, and that's just like an alfalfa and water mix that I, you know, I use as a, a foliar spray. Uh, I'm, even though I'm only... A half an acre I cover crop by at least by bed if not um, if not the whole thing I try to get at least uh, 85 to 90 percent of my garden into cover crop every year I normally use a uh, rye I use a winter rye and a hair and a hair, hairy vetch and Austrian winter pea mix and the reason I plant that is because it's something I can plant late in the season We've been hearing a lot at um, the last last talk I was at about you know getting it planted early, so that uh, it can scavenge for you. But that doesn't happen for me because I have everything in production for as much of the time as possible. So I get things cover cropped when I can. I use an earthway seeder and I drill it that way, and it works very well for me. And I cover crop some of it. Uh, I can get covered. Um, in uh, you know the end of September, beginning of October, but some of it I cover. I'm cover cropping now. Um, I do it whenever I can, and then I let that grow. Um, one of the biggest things for me has been to learn that for me to keep my soil healthy, I need to keep it covered with, and I do that with cover crop, with mulch, and of course with vegetables. I mulch everything that I possibly can with anything that I can possibly use. So I use pine needles. Pine needles are fine. They don't make the soil acidic. Um, I use leaves. I use grass clippings. I use whatever's free and whatever's close by for me for mulch. Um, and also I want to experiment with actually knocking the rye down and using that as, as, a, uh, as a mulch. I till, and I wanted to do less tillage, so we till usually once a year. We till everything down once a year and make new beds. I may be able to graduate from that and not do it quite as much. After that, I'm going to rely on a wheel hoe to take any excess weeds off um, and a broad fork. Um, another thing that I've found is with the two wheel, we have a for my space, the two-wheel tractor is perfect. Um, and I have found that when I do use the plow, the rotary plow on the tractor rather than the tiller, it disturbs the soil far less than the tiller does. So sometimes I'll run down and just throw the soil out, throw it back in if I have a bad weed problem. And I will still see 
it doesn't it doesn't break it up so badly that I'm that I'm completely it's not like a mixing bowl that way and I can I'll see moles I'll see bowls just scatter away or whatever and, and earth it doesn't even break up the earthworms uh, a lot of times with that rotary tiller um, so that's yeah so that's about that's that's where we're at and we're trying to work towards more and more no-till I think that with the uh, with the issue of weeds on an organic farm, it's fine to say oh, we're going to get those all under control with cover crop, but I can tell you that it's easier said than done. And even with my small, small space, all it takes is a good Delmarva rain and a week where you can't get in the garden at a certain time of the year, and the weeds can can become quite an issue. Uh, wood chips are another good mulch alternative to all these things that we were taught years ago that were going to cause uh, the soil to become too acid. And what I found in my experience is that is not the case. And then finally, what we do to keep things healthy is a lot of mineral, um, of, lately, a lot of focus on mineral, um, mineral health in the <clears throat> soil and remineralization and making sure that the soil test that we get shows us what micro minerals we need and putting sulfur back into the soil and things like that. So we're adding uh, a lot more minerals than we ever used to add. Zach, this is a little bit, um, you're a little bit newer to this, right? Yeah. And coming from a traditional, more traditional farming background. Yeah. Um, what have been your, your number one soil health practices to implement right off the bat? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I am a, a third generation farmer. I'm from Wisconsin. Um, so my family, going back to my grandfather at least, and I think even probably before him, but uh, you know, they always grew corn, beans, and we raised uh, beef cattle, and then I grew up working on a dairy farm. Um, so I was coming from a background of very much conventional. You know, it's, it, it, you're kind of going through high school and in college and all these things and seeing how dad and granddad did it. You kind of become like a tillage junkie. You know, it's like you enjoy it. It's just something about the smell, the sight, going through the fields and seeing all that broken up dirt, and it looks all neat and fancy, you know, and it's like, haha, you know, love it. Till to this day, it's like I'm still kind of a recovering tillage junkie. Um, so, you know, for us, um, kind of looking at things from a little different perspective, um, you know, although we have 40 acres, I've really tried to limit myself to about two acres of vegetable production. Um, you know, my wife can attest to the fact that if given the opportunity, I probably would try to do 40 acres of production and kill myself in the process. Um, I like to get in over my head a lot of times, so having that limiting factor is, is good uh, for us. Um, so a lot of what we do uh, is more with hand tools. Uh, you know, we have a walk-behind tractor. Um, it's called the BCS. If nobody knows what that is, you can look it up on the internet. It's, it's a wonderful uh, piece of equipment. Um, and so really with our soil and, and trying to improve the health of the soil, it was kind of a, an evolutionary journey for me going from thinking you need to use, you know, synthetic chemicals and herbicides and whatnot to uh, really, you know, provide for the plant's needs. Um, over the past, I would say maybe five years or so, really just a total mind shift where I've come to realize that it's the life in the soil that you need to be concerned about. Um, and so when I approach my cropping systems, when I'm looking at making decisions, I really ask myself in the back of my mind, what's best for the life in my soil? Um, I'm not to the point yet where I'm organic and I don't really know if that's ever going to be necessarily an option because I like to think of, you know, using everything as a tool. So if I, a couple of years ago, we had we put in strawberries and it was getting overtaken by a bunch of warm season grass. And I had to make a decision, you know, because you go in there and you pull it out by hand. Well, about the time you got to the end of the row, you had to start all over. And, you know, the grass had just been taking over everything. So I had to make a decision. Well, do I just let that happen and lose my strawberries or do I use a, an herbicide? So I ended up using herbicide. So with that in the back of my mind, thinking, well, I need to do something in the future to remedy the grass issue. So. I think through all my reading, all my research, YouTube videos, talking with Keith Burns and, uh, you know, Mr. Wiles and, and many others, you start to learn that if you get the biology in your soil right and the life in your soil right, it strikes a natural balance. And if you have healthy crops, they typically outcompete 
the weeds, or at least are able to you know run with them enough that it doesn't really affect your crop production. Um, so really, we've implemented five things in our farm that I feel are pretty critical to soil, and it's you know been repeated time and again here. Uh, you know, we implement minimal tillage. So I, I say that because we, how do you put a carrot seed in the ground and get seed soil contact without some type of soil disturbance, right? So my mindset is that we utilize cover crops a lot. Uh, we try to do minimal tillage. So anywhere I can, I do use cover crops. And a lot of times what I like to do is I'll kill that cover crop off using plastic tarps, things like that, leave that residue there. So when I'm looking at it, a lot of times what you can do, I found works really well, is leave that crop residue there. And if you're using transplants, just move a little bit of the residue aside, dig your hole, put your crop in, and then put the residue back. So you're not really having to disturb the soil much. You're keeping it covered. You're not tilling. Um, the BCS has an option on the tiller. You can get a, a, a big roller that goes on it, and I can adjust the depth to which I go. So when I'm tilling, um, you know, I can control it to just an eighth of an inch. Each click down is like an eighth of an inch, I think, or a quarter inch. So I, I'm minimally disturbing the soil when I have to. Um, so the soil disturbance is big, keeping living roots in the soil, which you've all heard, uh, feeds the soil life, keeping the soil covered when you don't have something growing. Um, we try the best of our ability to get our livestock on where we grow vegetables. You kind of get into some uh, safety issues, you know, with fresh animal manure or urine where your crops are growing, so you got to be careful with those kind of things. But in off seasons, like right now, we have a high tunnel up that we just put up. I uh, planted ryegrass in there. I'm grazing sheep in there right now, and then going to move them out, and we're going to put some of our broilers in there to graze on the. And then in this in summer, we'll put our tomatoes in there. Um, and then the last thing we really do is is the uh, biodiversity. So keeping a lot of different types of cover crops going. Um, so those are kind of steps that we've seen, and in, in, you know, similar to what you were saying, you know, when we got our farm as conventionally farmed for probably 200 years, ever since it's been a farm. Uh, we didn't really have worms, we didn't have bees, we had very few birds. Uh, and my wife and I, we got it in 2017. And so since then, I mean, you can go out now and see, you know, the big piles of, of the worm mounds that they create. We got honeybees, uh, we got a lot of birds, things like that. You see a lot of beneficials running around now. So um, it's encouraging, you know, they were saying you see worms, you, you know, you got some type of improvement. So. How about you, Tom? I feel like uh, using draft animals is something I don't know a whole lot about, but I'm sure that um, it presents some unique conditions. I mean, do you feel like the draft animals add to the um, add to soil health features? Are there challenges associated with that? Are they um, I think the biggest advantage with draft animals is that um, Maybe they're not necessarily lighter than a tractor, but the way they impact the soil is different. They're not rolling over the soil. Their hooves are just, um, you know, they're walking, so they're not contacting that row or the, the pathway with, um, in a continuous manner. Uh, and, and a lot of the equipment used with them is a lot lighter than a tractor would be pulling a piece of equipment behind it. Um, so I feel like the compaction issue is one of the major benefits of, or not relieving compaction is one of the major benefits of using horses at our scale. I mean, you can also accomplish the same thing if you're using hand tools and a BCS. It's the same kind of um, <clears throat> mindset. Uh, but our use of draft horses really stems from just the fact that we like horses and we've been lucky enough to incorporate them into our farm. Um, there's nothing really big and idealistic beyond that, except that there might be some added benefits to using them. Um, they are, they can be, if you're not into, if you do not like horses, they will frustrate you to no end. Um, so like we straddle both worlds. If we use horses um, and it's, it's a good day, everything's great. If we're having a rough day, we can always use a tractor to do a different job. Yeah. Are there any um, food safety issues, in, you know, in our in this new world of gap yeah. regulations? Yeah. How do you deal with that? With yeah, the there are food safety issues, and um, so the and you know the biggest would be the uh, horses manure in the field, um, and to alleviate that, we have we use bun bags on the back of the horses 
that catches the, the manure. Um, and if we have any manure fall into the field, um, you know, miss the bun bag or whatever, we'll flag it um, with the, if it's in within like a 120 day harvest range. And we won't ha harvest. If we're cult say we're cultivating a lettuce field and manure falls, we'll flag that and we won't harvest within like a five foot radius of that, um, of that manure. Um, yeah, other than that, the, usually horses don't uh, urinate while they're working, which is a great, <laughs> great, uh, Fun yeah. fact. Yeah. <laughs> um, Hattie, you touched on this a little bit, but um, on such a small scale, um, I know that it's just really important to keep your land under constant production with tight successions and, you know, in order to um, be economical and to meet demand at market, how do you prioritize soil health under those conditions where, you know, it, it may be a decision between being able to continue farming uh, for another year because of the, the economics of it or and maintaining the soil health? Um, I think that the healthier your soil is, the more you can do that and the more you can continue to farm it. Um, as I say, hard. We farm, uh, we, I'll turn over arugula in three weeks and then I'm going to put something in right after it. And uh, so uh, some of it is rotation. What am I putting in after it? Um, I'm, I'll put in, I'll, I'll grow beans. I'll grow something um, in a different family. Uh, a lot of what we also do are cut flowers and typically a cut flower bed is another good rotation and a cut flower bed will stay in the same place for much longer than some of our other vegetable crops. Um, and as I said, uh, we will cover crop everything and anything whenever we can. If I have a spot that's free in the summer, I'll use buckwheat and uh, cover crop for f four to six weeks in the middle of the summer and then use that land again to put something in for the fall. So it's a juggling act and it's all about whether you're keeping the soil healthy and whether you've got the um, you know, taking the soil tests and making sure you have the zinc, making sure you have the sulfur, making sure your minerals are, are well balanced, making sure you've got boron. All those things are going to, um, especially in this, this soil on, on Delmarva, it's old soil. And where I'm, where I'm uh, gardening is, used to be an orchard and it got a, a lot of lime on it and just really tired soil. Um, but that having been said, we add, I, I do composting kind of like, um, you know, more like the French used to do it in their urban gardens. I use a lot of compost. I compost every single time that I put in a new crop. I compost an inch. And uh, because of the phosphate in the, in the compost that's available locally, I've sourced some compost from out of the state that's made with just uh, food scraps and no manure base uh, from veteran compost so that we can still continue to add the compost. We make some compost, but we're too small to make enough compost. But I use at least 15 yards of compost for what is really less than half an acre per year, at least that much, plus the cover cropping. And plus, on top of that, all of the mulching that we do, um, you know, all as much organic, the more organic matter that I can put into the ground, the the better I can continue to um, kind of overuse the soil. And so. are you able to maintain the kind of recommended four-year rotations on Not that at scale? All. Not yeah. at all. And it really doesn't seem to be that necessary. Yeah. The only thing that I would like to rotate more would be the solanaceous family. What we did in, in that case, we were a small area, but you know you want to sell tomatoes because they're so profitable. We stopped growing eggplant and peppers because they were also a solanaceous, and we said, why are we wasting space, solanaceous space on something that we're making, not making very much profit? So some of it's a cost analysis to say, gee, I want my solanaceous space for heirloom tomatoes. And we also, because of that, that is one thing that does need some rotation for, in my experience, what we do is we use grafted tomato plants by and large so that we don't have to worry as much about soil diseases in the, in the, with that. 
So how about, does anyone want to share any, any of their big challenges, ones that maybe you have found a solution to or ones that are still pending solution? I'll chime in. Um, <clears throat> well, I think in my situation, it's always, uh, you know, like at the beginning of the year, you have all these big ideas, you know, of how much you want to do. Um, and then, you know, like I think you mentioned, you get behind the first, the first rain, fall, you can't get in the field. And then so how do you, you know, maintain this, these, uh, these practices when you, you know, you're getting behind on weed pressure and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, it's definitely a big challenge trying to, um, uh, trying to scale up, you know, trying to have more, um, you know, yield but facing these issues and trying to have the, you know, uh, the practices that we've been talking about. So uh, one of the things that I've been working on the past few years is one, um, uh, farming smaller plots, but doing more on those plots. Um, so my beds are 75 uh, foot beds. And I think um, one thing is that's a psychological thing. Like, you know, when I, um, when I was apprenticing, we had these 200 foot beds and you get out there and you're thinking like, man, I gotta you know, hand weed this whole 200 foot bed. So just um, you know, scaling back you know, the, the distance to 75 foot you know, um, beds, now I'm able to manage that you know, uh, doing like uh, you know, hand weeding. Also, um, I can also in that same um, area plant a lot more things. So, you know, you talk about biodiversity. So I'll plant uh, tomato plants and then, um, you know, um, sort of my tomato plants are every 18 inches. And then in between those tomato plants, they're surrounded by basil, you know, so it's, it's also uh, uh, taking up that area, you know, so you're adding more biodiversity, um, you know, um, uh, mixing up the the this, the uh, the scents and stuff for the pest, also having more things to outcompete the weeds, and then next to them, I'm planting other beneficial crops, you know, peppers, marigolds, like fitting as many things into that one tight tight space, and what that has done is uh, it's helped increase the yields on a smaller space, and the smaller space I'm able to handle better by you know with you know just me, so. Um, and I probably get most of my production out of my high tunnels, which are, you know, 30 by 48 uh, foot spaces. But I can, I was just checking a, um, a post I did on Instagram. I had over 500 plants in one of my uh, high tunnels last year. So, um, you know, when I think about should I go ahead and, and um, plant this whole acre field over here, or you know, uh, focus on just this this high tunnel, which I can, I can you know, uh, um, you know, stay ahead of the the uh, the weed pressure. I can get in there, mulch on time when I need to, uh, and everything is looking, you know, beautiful. Yeah, kind of going off what Thelonious is saying. You know, it's it's a matter. I mean, aside from the obvious issues that everybody has, like pests, weeds, things like that, um, you know, and those kind of things in my mind are, are kind of resolved in a sense of thinking outside the box. Um, you know, like for our pests, for example, we try to utilize beneficials, you know, insects, uh, birds, things like that. So this year we're kind of <laughs> revamping our field, so to speak. We do a similar method to Thelonious where we have 100 foot rows and they're 30 feet wide. Um, and then within that we have seven rows that are 30 inches wide. So it enables us <clears throat> Um, so, but what we're doing, so we're, I'm adding an eighth row and that's going to be like a permanent, uh, like wildflower mix, so to speak, and things that attract beneficials. But, you know, f for us, other than dealing with pests and weeds, things like that, it really is a matter of efficiency for us. Um, so keeping it smaller, thinking, you know, like he was saying about how can I maximize production on this small space instead of taking up all 40 of my acres, maybe to spread out. We've chosen to stay with the BCS because we can work on 30 inch rows. Um, you know, like this year, for example, we invested in a compost spreader, which is beautiful because you just load it full of compost, set it to the depth you want the compost to be spread, and you drive a BCS down the row. And you don't gotta, you know, what, last year it took three people 
an hour to spread compost in one of those 30 by 100 fields. Now I can do it by myself in an hour and it's, it's just a much better system. The compost is much better spread out. So it's just thinking uh, to yourself, how can I be more efficient? Because it's, it's difficult to find labor and, you know, yeah, just the more efficient you can be, the better. So just thinking outside the box and, and making it easier on yourself instead of harder. <laughs> uh, my biggest challenge that I've been trying to wrap my head around for the past couple of years is how to do no-till at our scale. Um, we grow 10, <clears throat> our footprint is roughly like 10 to 12 acres and we're double cropping uh, maybe half of that as well. Um, and I am familiar with the general, no, like smaller scale no-till vegetable techniques and I have a hard time. Think our fields are, are divided up into half acre um, blocks and a half acre block is um, 75 feet by 300 feet. My experience has shown that you still need to mulch after you're crimping your rye. Um, so you, that, that mostly on our size is going to be a hand work job. So if anybody knows any, anyone else doing a 10 acre no-till produce, uh, mixed diversified produce, I'd love to talk to them. Um, <laughs> because that's, that's, I see all these benefits that we're talking about um, and the most that we can do on our scale is really try to reduce tillage um, to prepare for our vegetable crop and then increase uh, cover crop during vegetable production and immediately afterwards. But I don't see an easy way for us to um, to stop tillage uh, season long, like one year or multi-year? Multi um, well, that actually segues pretty well into my next question, which is, is access to tools or affordability of tools, you know, a barrier to adopting some of the practices that you would like to? Um, is there, you know, a dream piece of equipment that you would like to see invented or made at a scale that that is um, more applicable to, to smaller acreage? Um, I think the tools are there. I know that um, the Grillo and the BCS, the two-wheel tractors, that you can get a lot of different implements for them to do a lot of the things we're talking about, um, to just you know lightly till stuff into the top inch or so of soil or um, any number of things that, that you want to do. But I, 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 for, for, for myself, what it is is that I, can never afford the outlay of $1,000 or 1500 for, for another implement that's only going to be used for, you know, such a small area. I'd love to have a paper pot planter, but it, again, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of outlay for such a small area because the, the income that I get from the farm is only enough, is only enough for me and, and uh, uh, so, some help during the summer. So I'm not, you know, it's not a big operation. The capital just isn't there for the the equipment that would benefit me. So I make do with the the things that I have, um, and there are several pieces of equipment that I would benefit from greatly. Yeah. You know, when I think about the um, the tools, you know, it's not possible for me to invest in a big you know drill, you know, and all this other equipment. Um, and also when, you know, when I travel to different places, like where I just came from, uh, Timor Less, a small country, um, they're doing nothing but organic farming and all with hand tools and they have this like beautiful soil. And I realized they're, you know, they have a different, uh, you know, uh, ecosystem. It's a lot of forested uh, soil, you know, so, uh, you know, when I see at my farm is, um, I look at it more as, you know, a long-term, uh, you know, vision of trying to uh, rehabilitate the soil. Um, <clears throat> and that's, um, you know, doing things like, um, you know, attracting uh, the different beneficial insects by planting uh, different you know, perennial things, you know, around. Um, but in terms of, like, tools, I'm still pretty old-fashioned. I use the, you know, just the hand hole you know, um, that I inherited from, you know, my pops. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's rough, uh, but, you know, the results um, are always uh, good because the soil is uh, nice and loose versus when I first started. Um, 
and then I'll come by with just a, uh, a hand cultivator, you know, after, um, you know, after my transplants have been in the ground, I'll come by with the hand cultivator, uh, and then I'll, you know, uh, mulch. And, um, you know, I can see the difference just empirically, you know, uh, the difference in the, um, you know, the yields and how healthy the crops look. Um, I did do a, a biological soil test when I first started. And, um, you know, the, the numbers of, uh, you know, bacteria and fungi were, were good, but uh, the amount of uh, that fungi and bacteria that were active were not good. And from uh, what I gathered from the different uh, recommendations, you know, different talks and stuff, the main key is just organic matter. You know, so um, uh, we've already heard about, you know, uh, you know, different ways of, of adding that organic matter through, you know, the uh, composting, you know, through the, uh, the living roots, you know, the uh, cover cropping. Um, but, you know, that's, that's the main thing is just, uh, you know, if, if you don't, you know, learn anything else, it's just, you know, add the organic matter. Um, and, you know, my goal is to eventually uh, have a closed loop system where I, I don't have to um, get any, anything from outside, any external inputs, but just, you know, compost made, uh, you know, from my own farm. Uh, and then uh, the soil being able to get everything that it, that it needs from the, uh, the, the plant itself. Can I see a quick show of hands? Who, is anybody thinking about getting into market gardening, vegetable production, small scale, large scale, anything like that? <clears throat> I can tell you that it's, you'll quickly separate the wheat from the chaff, right? Um, there's just certain things that can be said about farming that it is physical. It's hard work. You ha I think you have to be a certain type of person, so to speak, to be willing to get out there day in, day out. The sun, the rain, the hot, the cold, you know, dealing with getting bitten by bugs and all kinds of other things. <clears throat> so, you know, as far as a magic pill or a tool that, you know, th there's only so many things you can afford or that are practical for your scale. Um, and I think that's, to me, probably one of the better I guess it'd be considered a tool is kind of put together, make sure you have a business plan put together. Know what you want to do, know what your capabilities are, you know, and, and you, you can surprise yourself for sure, but more or less I'm just talking about how big do you want to get? Because, you know, there's a difference between farming 12 acres, I couldn't do that on with a BCS tractor, but I made a conscious decision to stay smaller and made the conscious decision to work with hand tools like a broad fork. Anybody familiar with a broad fork? Know what a broad fork is? Yeah, buddy. You try working through some hard compact soil with a broad fork and have to do that on an acre? Okay, let's do it. Come on down. You know, it's a lot of work is what I'm saying. A lot of work. So, you know, there, there's different things that you got to look at. And if you scale up to 10, 12 acres, I think it is a good idea to go with a tractor and it gives you more capabilities. But for someone like Hattie to go out and buy a $50,000 tractor for her backyard is nuts. So it's just, you know, just gonna have to accept the fact that some things, you're gonna have to get the pitchfork and the shovel and the wheelbarrow and just go to work. Um, Or it's coming out of Europe. 
Um, but I think that if there was a way to get equipment for people to rent a BCS, it would be really useful for me some of the time, but not all the time. And the other ones is just sitting there. But you've got to have somebody who can manage it, somebody who can deliver the equipment, and somebody who can maintain the equipment. And that's what these county programs do. It's just they don't have the equipment we can do. Right. Yeah, that's something that Future Harvest has actually been looking into. We did a tool share feasibility study focused on um, smaller scale equipment that could be leased or rented. So um, that may be in the pipeline, hopefully. Um, is that something that you all would take advantage of if it was available, shared equipment, equipment available for, for rent or? Um, we, we spoke to quite a few programs across the country, and, and that was an absolute, so um, keeping it clean and, and maintained. Um, so I wanted to get to at least one more question, hopefully. Um, I wanted to talk about how, um, how you communicate soil health to your customers, um, if it's something that they are making the connection between soil health and healthy food, um, is it something they care about, or is it really just focused on, on the food, you know, is that, how is that developing? I, I teach um, gardening classes every spring to home gardeners, many of whom are my customers, and um, also at the farmer's market, um, I do one large farmer's market, and what I'm always talking about to them is how the soil health is related to the nutrition of what they're e eating and how the flavor of what they eat has a lot, has a lot to say about the nutrition, the nutritional profile of a piece of um, fruit or vegetable. So um, for me, it's about, and, and that's part of being part of a small community and a small farm where you have direct marketing that you have the opportunity to educate your customer. And that's one of the biggest reasons why, I, why I'm doing what I do is because I do like to teach and I like to have the opportunity to share what I know with people who really wanna know about it and who really wanna get their food. Um, they want clean food and they want healthy food and they wanna be able to get it locally if they can. And those are the people that I'm interested in serving. So yeah, definitely. It's, for me, it's part of my mission. Maybe annual farm tours and field days for our, um, specifically for our CSA members. We have a, an ice cream social in the spring where we'll take a farm tour and a farm walk with them and kind of uh, point out what's happening. And our conversations, for me, always go towards cover crops and what's happening above ground and below ground. And people are generally really interested in, in hearing about that. and. Um, are sometimes surprised that there's so much thought going into uh, rotation and that it, it can become so complicated so fast. Um, so yeah, that's how it happens for us. <laughs> so they are starting to, to get it, that connection. Thelonious? Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know, some farmers don't like uh, going to farmers markets, but I love going to farmers markets. That's my time to you know, talk to the customers, um, but yeah, they're always interested to know, firstly, um, where did the food come from? And then when I say, oh, I, you know, I grew all this, you know, then they, you know, immediately, uh, as they're grabbing things, they're asking, you know, um, you know, questions. And I'm talking about, um, you know, how I grow the different things. Uh, like you say, uh, some of the methods, crop rotation. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, uh, most customers now are becoming, uh, they're aware now, they're conscious, and they want to know that you know, uh, you know, what you're doing and how things are growing. I think I asked, um, as when we were preparing for this, if you could each come up with two top tips to share uh, with the audience um, uh, about meeting soil health challenges or things that have worked for you, anything big or small that, that you can share. And then we will uh, open it up to questions for the last few minutes. Oh, I forgot, so I'm going to have to make something up on the spot. Um, <laughs> what, um, uh, uh, and what came to mind right away was getting the weeds when they're young. And um, there's two ways to do that. Um, 
for things that come up a little bit slowly, you can flame them. You can flame weed them. And you can get a really cheap little flamer and go up and down your rows and flame the carrots before they emerge or uh, flame your scallions or your onions before they emerge <coughs> and do away with it, make a much cleaner seed bed. Um, and then along that same line, it's about getting out there with your little teeny thin hoe or whatever you're using, a little wire weed or whatever, and weeding the bed before you can almost even see any weeds at all. So it's about getting getting into the garden before the weeds are a problem, before the weeds are really even visible, um, is the best way for me to have a, uh, have a, uh, because mulch is great, but you can't mulch a bed of, of uh, you know, salad or things that are planted in a 30 foot, a 30 inch wide bed and you've got five or six rows in that 30 inch bed, you can't mulch that. So those are things you will spend time weeding. So quick is best. Mm -hmm. White thread stage. White thread stage, yeah. Let's see, one tip I think is, even if you think it's too late in the season to get a cover crop in the ground, you should do it, even if it's just bare rye seed. Uh, in my experience, that's gonna, there's gonna be a few warm days, it's gonna germinate, it might just be one little cotyledon. Um, but come this time of year, it's going to start growing, and um, you know, in a few weeks, you'll have soil coverage, and um, instead of just bare soil, that itself is going to become compacted. And then along those lines, um, weeds themselves can be a cover crop. Um, we have really strong um, uh, chickweed and field pennycrest pressure in our on our farm which we've battled, tried to get, you know, we need to get rid of these winter annuals, need to get rid of these winter annuals. And then maybe, you know, the last couple of years it's been like, well, these are actually a good cover crop. Chickweed creates a really dense sod cover over the winter. Um, and then we're able to um, work that, plow that, skim plow that in the summer, uh, not in the summer, in the spring, and get ourselves ready to plant. So maybe a change of perspective sometime is, is good. Great. You guys have any quick tips you want to throw out there before we take a question or two and wrap it up? Uh, again, I mean, I know it's been said, but I don't think it can be, you know, overemphasized. Is it really just keeping, keeping your soil covered or keeping something living in your soil is the most important thing? Um, you know, you got to think about the, the microbiology in your soil and, and what you're feeding it because that's, that's going to be your greatest ally you know, in, in everything. So, you know, like you, you just said, I mean, you'd be amazed what plants will do. Um, and really just, you know, take the time to understand y your land, your environment, what's around you, um, you know, and, and really thinking outside the box, you know, don't, don't box yourself into thinking, I got to stick to this. Be willing to change, be flexible, um, see how your land reacts to certain things. Uh, because no, no two scenarios are the same, no two pieces of ground are the same, so you got different challenges. So, you know, what might work for one of these guys up here might not work for me, so. Always experiment. Don't let the season go by without, uh, you know, uh, trying something new. And then it's really all about the timing, like finding your stride between, you know, getting your cover crop in um, and then, um, you know, your uh, rotations that you're going to do. So you almost have to have a, you know, a big plan. Like your plan has to be five to eight years knowing what, you know, what's going to come after this crop, you know, in what field and then kind of, uh, you know, figuring out your, your stride, your timing, you know, on your, um, your land. For me, it kind of goes, it's like a risk management idea. So when we first bought our farm, you know, and it goes back to what I just said about getting to know your land. We, when, I, when we first bought the place, there was this area, this field that I thought, oh, this would be perfect. We'll grow vegetables there this year. And that following spring, which is 2018, we got 76 inches of rainfall where I was. And that, where I wanted to plant, was a lake. Um, so it took a couple years to kind of figure out the lay of the land, where the water goes, where the soil compaction is, what stays dry and whatnot. So we've done things to kind of deal with the climate is, you know, now we're growing on the highest part of our ground, you know, where I was able to observe a couple years, seeing 
how the water drained or at least you know flowed off so it didn't flood um, we started to implement a lot of uh, high tunnels heated tunnels things like that that you know at least allow you to have a little bit of control of, of what's going on on your crops um, you know like Thelonious is saying I mean you can get a lot better production and a lot more predictable production out of a controlled setting like a greenhouse than just out in the field um, so that you know really that's the best thing and, and really you know when you build up your soil and I think Hattie hinted at this when you have a healthy soil it's naturally more resilient to whatever hits it so be it drought flood pest weed pressure whatever if you have that resiliency in your soil you have that living healthy soil it's gonna really help you give you that you know wiggle room and that ability to absorb whatever whatever comes your way a couple of things that um, that I just thought about then when Zach was talking um, first of all beans sometimes aren't gonna work now in the middle of the summer it's too hot the blossoms drop so we've actually made those into a more of a shoulder crops spring and fall um, raised beds if you don't have raised beds your stuff can easily easily get drowned um, so that's that's another thing that we we're working on all the time uh, tomato plants if there's any way at all then you can, you can get a small uh, portable high tunnel or what, what do they call them caterpillar. Tunnels, caterpillar. Cat, the caterpillar. caterpillar tunnel to cover your tomato plants in the field you'll have much better tomatoes you won't have the uh, you know we need a, a good rainstorm in the end of July will just ruin your tomatoes um, so de definitely I think that some of the climate mit cli things that we that I do for uh, changing climate have just happened without me even realizing I'm doing them so um, I'm not growing certain tomato varieties that I know are going to drop their blossoms when we have warm nights. So I'm looking for heat tolerant tomato varieties. Um, so, you know, it goes on and on. And there's a, there's a couple of heat tolerant uh, pole beans that you can grow, like the rattlesnake. That's a good one. Um, so, yeah, you just keep looking for ways to where you can mitigate some of, um, some of the stuff. But I do find with the humid, humid nights, humid hot nights during the summer that, um, it's a challenge and one of the things that um, uh, it's a very frustrating challenge and it can really be hard on a lot of agriculture um, so for me one of the things I'm doing is growing ginger and turmeric out in the field not in hoop houses it does very well out there and it's very hot for it and it doesn't seem to mind at all it grows really well so yeah you just keep adapting keep adapting probably the main thing I do to mitigate uh, climate change is uh, succession planting like I never plant, all, you know, all of one crop at the same time. Uh, so, uh, and also not even in the same uh, field. Uh, and my land is like, I actually have like different soil types. So part of my land is, is very uh, sandy. The other part is very uh, sort of loamy. So I'll try different things in different areas at different times. Uh, and then also I've started to add different crops, uh, like ethnic crops that do very well, like okra, hibiscus, and stuff like that, that are just, you can throw it out there, and very low maintenance. They do well under, you know, different uh, conditions. Great. Well, I think we should probably wrap it up. I want to make sure everyone gets to stretch their legs before the next session. Uh, I work for Future Harvest, and we're, we've expanded the benchmark study into Maryland, and I wanted to make one last plug before the day is over that if you're interested, we have a flyer on the Future Harvest table, or you can ask me about it. And I'm sure our panelists would be happy to continue asking questions out in the hall if you have any. So thank you. Thank you.